Okay, welcome everybody um, to our, our second in a series of webinars on personalized learning um, here in the state of Michigan. Um, we have uh, Ben Gilpin with us today, and I'll let him do an introduction um, of himself here in a second. But uh, just to give a little background, um, these webinars are based on a series of um, vignettes that we've collected throughout the state of Michigan. Um, on the screen now is the schedule of those webinars, so those will be happening uh, through May 21st. And this information, uh, along with some updates, can be found on our website. Uh, my name is Greg Dion. I'm the supervisor of the Curriculum and Instruction Unit here at the Michigan Department of Education in the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. Um, I did mention that these vignettes are um, also featured in a um, what we call the Connect newsletter through the Center on Innovations and Learning. So those can be found on our website also and also on their website. Um, but this is all an attempt to um, try to get some examples out there to the state of Michigan. And um, actually we've been able to share them beyond Michigan uh, with some other states. Uh, we have um, been able to develop definitions throughout the state. And we pulled together a, a group of um, teachers and some administrators to work on personalized learning in the state of Michigan um, to try to build some capacity and try to build some tools uh, for people that are implementing or plan to implement. So without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it over to Ben Gilpin and let him um, introduce himself and uh, if there are questions. Um, please include those in the chat. So, uh, Ben, I think you uh, still have the uh, post right, so you should be able to start sharing. Got it. Okay. Well, hello. Um, as uh, Greg had mentioned, my name is Ben Gilpin. Uh, this is my fifth year as building principal at Warner Elementary. Uh, Warner Elementary is located uh, in, the, in the county of Jackson, which is southern Michigan. Um, before I was at uh, Warner, I actually taught nine years uh, at a local district in fifth grade. So I've, I've been in education now 15, 16, 17 years. Um, and I got I, I to gotta say that um, at one point in my career, um, I remember hearing someone saying, I know a day is going to be coming where every student has an IEP. You know, that kind of, that kind of struck me as, as an extreme comment, but that's what kind of got me energized for when, um, when the Department of Education reached out and wanted to talk more about personalized learning. A um, couple more things about me. Um, I do have, I do have um, a wife and two boys. My boys are um, in seventh grade and fourth grade. Uh, some of the things that I enjoy doing in my spare time, I'm not just a principal. I'm also a person that uh, enjoys running. I like to get out and play some golf on occasion. Um, I'm also a connected educator, so you could find me on Twitter at, at Benjamin Gilpin. Um, I'm also on Voxer, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those tools later on as, as I share some things that are going on here at Warner Elementary. Um, but just to kind of jump in, um, really the focus is going to be on creating a love of learning through personalization. And it's going to be some of the things that um, I'm, I notice on a daily basis that are happening here at Warner Elementary. And I've also noticed them in some of our other neighboring buildings here in the Western School District. Um, one of my big passions is creating a joyful learning environment. And, and what that means to me is it warms, it warms my heart when I see our kids smiling and engaged in the learning process. Um, and I got to tell you that even when I was in the classroom, I tried to make that happen on a daily basis. Um, what sometimes doesn't get noticed in the, in the entire scheme of personalized learning is building culture. Culture is so vital in the learning process. You need to have a culture in your building that um, that people feel able to take a risk and they feel as though it's okay to make a mistake and fail and that we learn through failure and there, there's an analogy out there that um, 
the word fail stands for first attempt in learning. And, and I stand for that because I want to be able to see not only my teachers taking risks and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and trying to get better, but I want to see that from our kids as well. Um, and that's not a mentality that is prevalent in every school district, but I do believe if we're going to be moving forward with personalized learning, that is probably one of the most important, building that culture of lifelong learners and risk takers and people that really feel as though they can, they can step out on a limb and do something that they believe is best for kids. Um, so I'm going to jump in here, and I'm and hopefully what you find through this webinar is you find some ideas, but you also get the idea that um, you can take your next step. And I'll get to that next step here in a minute. But I I don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of things. I just want to give you some ideas on how you can make how you can start personalizing some learning in your classroom. But I also want to also highlight the importance of the overall culture. Now, to me, it begins and ends with relationships. Relationships with staff members, relationships with students, relationships with parents, relationships with community members. It always begins and ends with relationships. If you don't, if you don't know your students, if you don't know your staff, you're going to fizzle in a hurry. Um, some of the ways to, to build those relationships, um, I pride myself in knowing every student's name. Um, I also pride myself in knowing all of my staff members, not only not only their names, obviously, but also their kids' names and their spouse names. Some of those little things really can set a foundation. And if you think about personalized learning, personalized learning is, I mean, think of that first word, personal. If you don't know your people, if you don't know your staff members, if you don't know your kids, how can you make it personal? And that's just the overriding question that I would always ask. So it's, it's, it's basically, to me, one of the most important things is that beginning and ending with relationships. Um, getting to know your students. What are their passions? What are their interests? What are their hobbies? What are their learning styles? And what are their triggers, their strengths and their weaknesses? Um, every year when I go around and I start doing class lists, I constantly have people that say, well, you must have, you must divide your class lists up by high, medium, low as far as academic level. And I got to tell you, I don't really look at that off the bat. What I look for is personalities. So I know the personalities of my students. I know the personalities of my teachers. And I try to match up those personalities. Because if I'm trying to make it a personalized learning environment, I want it to be where a student feels comfortable with a teacher. And I want a teacher to be able to say, I know how I can get the best out of that student. That to me is personalized learning. Um, I, I'm i blessed to have several teachers that go to sporting events on the weekend, that go to plays in the evenings, that just give it their all to make sure that they connect with kids first and foremost. And that's that, that's that relationship piece. Uh, let me press play here so you don't see all the slides on the side. Um, so here, um, where are you on the ladder of learning? Now, I've got, here at Warner, there are 18 teachers. And this is the part, I, I want to spend some time on this slide. And I want all of you just to kind of, this is where you're going to have to do some imagining. You're going to have to try to figure out where you are. So we're all on this continuum. And you've got some people that are teaching whole group. And we all know them. And maybe you are a whole group teacher. And that's okay. And we've also got people that maybe they're doing some personalized learning. Maybe what they're doing in their classroom, they're very individualized. They have groups of one or two. And, and the teacher is really, really personalizing that learning that's going on in that classroom. There's not necessarily, I, I want everybody to hear this, I don't, I'm not going to stand here today and I'm not going to say one is better than the other. What you're going to hear from me is everybody's at a different spot and I want to see people take the next step. Um, I have some teachers here at Warner Elementary that are whole group teachers and they're very, very good. They're also taking that step forward and they're trying to become more personalized. I've also got some teachers in this building that are personalized. 
and they're trying to get better at it. So the whole point is, how do we take that positive step forward? So think about it as a ladder. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it, just not saying it's bad, but I'm going to say the bottom rung would be whole group instruction. And that's what most of us did in college where we sit in our chairs and, and you've got the teacher in the front and the teacher is probably writing some things on the board and doing a bit of lecturing. Um, that would be that whole group instruction. We're all being taught the same way. The next rung of the ladder is a center-based where possibly there's four centers around the room and, and the students go from center to center to center to center and they're in small groups, but they're all doing the exact same thing. Then we have some stations, uh, and maybe a station is, and you see this nowadays, especially with technology, maybe you have a station that's using technology and QR codes, maybe you have another station that's doing some art, maybe you have another station that is, um, that's doing some type of a worksheet. So it's, it's going to look a whole lot like a center, but a station allows for some personalization. Then you've got small groups. And in those small groups, you're, the whole point is you're going to be differentiating. And you're going to have students doing different activities at different, at, uh, at diff in different small groups. After that, the next rung of the ladder would be individualized learning. Now, individualized learning is the end goal. The end goal, everybody's going to hit the same target. But the way they get to that end target is going to be very different. That's going to be an individualized approach. And then finally, that, that next rung of the ladder is going to be personalized learning. And personalized learning, they're not necessarily all going to hit the same spot in the end. They're, they're, students are going to be all over the map, and they're going to be doing projects, and they're going to be doing, um, they're, going to pro they're going to be creating things, and their overall end goal isn't necessarily all going to look alike. Um, there's going to be a strong need when you see individualized learning and personalized learning, you're going to see a strong need for rubrics. And, and that's what I always encourage the teachers here, especially at Warner Elementary, that when I meet with them and they're doing some of these personalized learning touches and, indiv indiv and individualizing the, the learning process, that they are using some type of a rubric that helps them share with parents and share with students how they're doing on the learning. So that, to me, that is the ladder of learning. And the whole goal is, how do you take the next step? So if you're a whole group teacher, how do you go from whole group and you start doing some center-based? And I'm not saying for seven hours of the day. I'm not even saying for five hours of the day. For maybe an hour, maybe two hours, you take that next step and you do some centers. Maybe you're already doing centers. How do you go from center-based to some stations? and so on and so forth. But it's all about taking that next step. Um, and here's, here's the reasoning behind that. So personalized learning, a big part of it is the key word is differentiation. So we've got the relationship piece, but we also want to differentiate the learning. If I, as an administrator, expect that out of my teachers, I want them to personalize the learning, I want them to differentiate, Shouldn't I also expect that out of my teachers? That's my stance. My stance is if I'm going to expect them to do it, I also need to have the same expectations for them. So that's the whole point behind the ladder of learning that we do here at Warner Elementary. I will, ease, I will tell you flat out, just being very frank with you, 18 teachers in the building, they're not all doing personalized learning. I've got a couple of whole group teachers. I've got several that are doing small groups, stations, center-based. I've got a couple that are doing some individualized, and I've got a couple that are doing the personalized learning. And so they're all over the map. And I think that's pretty, pretty typical of almost any school building. You're going to have people all over the map. And if we, all, if we expect everybody to move at the same pace at the same time, that's when things fall apart. As administrators, as educators, we have to be willing to be flexible and let people grow at their pace. The key word is grow and be moving forward. Okay, let's let's move on to the next one. Growth mindset. Growth mindset is a, is an. As I talk to my teachers, I have a weekly blog. I share it with them typically on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. It usually has some type of a a reading piece that I'm trying to really spark some reflection and some thought. 
Um, I also throw in some articles because what I want them to do is I'm constantly challenging them to be moving forward, growing. How are you, how are you getting better? Because um, the minute we, I mean, there's the old cliche, the minute we stop getting better, we're going backwards. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we try to make tomorrow better than today. And, and you know, some people have said that, um, that they love that, that mentality. They, they love the fact that they're, it's, they're not afraid to make mistakes. And every day, is try, every day is a new day. You're just trying to get better. Um, it's also one of those adages that we don't rest on success. You know, if you're, if you're doing a pretty good job, there's always room for, for growth. Nobody's perfect. Um, so as you take a look at this, no matter what rung of the ladder you're on, how you take the next step, uh, there's a couple quotes on here. Learning isn't easy. Embrace the struggle and grow. Uh, and then you've got the two differences, fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. There are times in my career, and, I, and I'll give you, I'll just give you a story. I was, um, I was probably in my seventh year, and I was butting heads with my administrator. Um, and what I was finding, my mindset was, I was trying to take things off my plate. I was trying to do less and less and less. And I started looking at the clock more, and my lesson plans were getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and because I was, because the culture was not real healthy, I was letting that destroy my, my growth mindset and I was getting into a fixed mindset. I was avoiding challenges. I was ignoring any feedback. I, I basically was looking at the clock and, and just trying to figure out how do I make it through the day. Um, fortunately for me, I had a strong network that surrounded me, and I still remember her name. Uh, her name's Sherry, and she pulled me aside, very veteran teacher, and she said, this isn't you. And she said, you know what? You are great with kids. You're great with parents. Um, you gotta, you've got to focus. You've got to focus on the positive, and thank goodness that, um, that Sherry came along. And, but I think that all of us, because, because all of us are, don't have it easy, we have these struggles. How do we, how do we get through some of those, those fixed mindset times and keep the focus back on growth mindset? And that's, I constantly am challenging my staff to have that growth mindset, to keep moving forward, embracing the challenges. And, and it's okay. If someone gives you feedback, how are you going to take that and use it to your advantage? Um, trying to be inspired by others in the building. We've done some things here at Warner where we call them um, instructional rounds where teachers will observe teachers. And that is powerful because they're not coming back and they're not saying to me, well, you know, I, I don't think they're doing a good job. What they're doing is they're going in and, they're, and their peers are pushing them to get better and better and better. That to me is a powerful tool. Learning, learning from fellow educators there, to me, there's nothing better. Okay, so ways to shift the learning. So here, here are going to be some ideas. If you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, okay, um, I'm not necessarily a whole group teacher, but I do a little bit of whole group. I do some small group. I do some stations. I do a little bit of that. How can I take the next step? How can I become more personalized? The first one I would, I would encourage someone would be through flipped classroom. Now this is not going to be a webinar all on flipped classroom, but I'm going to give you some ideas. So basically a flipped classroom is, the, is this model where you're going to have the students take home the lecture. They're going to take home the instruction. Um, a perfect example is my, my son will go home and he's got a math lesson on his, and it's the teacher can make it on a YouTube video, teacher can um, make it through iTunes U, um, teacher can just can simply just have a video, an iMovie, and send that to the kids. The kids will then go home, and, and I know some people will say, well, what if the kids don't have uh, connectivity at home? Well, sometimes you're going to have that, but I would bet most students in the year 2015, most students do have the ability to be able to watch something at home or stream it or have some type of access to the Internet. So the whole goal, once again, you're going to go home, you're going to watch this mini lesson. And I, and I want to repeat again, mini lesson. It should be somewhere between, and I mean, my opinion is it should be somewhere between three and eight minutes. And eight minutes is actually pretty long. 
I would really encourage people three to six minutes. That's going to be the gist of it. So you're going to have people learning this, this skill, and then they're going to bring that skill back into the classroom the next day, and instead of having to get up in front and lecture and teach, they're going to go off that main skill that you taught through the flip video, and then they're going to be doing something in class. They're going to be doing a project that's going to be putting that skill in process. So now that you as the teacher get to go around and work individually and be able to have some quality time with each student rather than standing at the front and just giving a lecture. Um, so I'm going to say it again, three to eight minutes. Some people will disagree with that, and some people might say you have to be you have to be longer to be able to teach the lesson. What I've noticed, what I've looked at as far as research goes, is the longer your video is, the more you lose the students. If you keep it focused to your main point, that's when you're going to keep the attention span a whole lot better. Uh, let's see. So let's go through this slide again. Uh, the term is widely used to describe almost any class structure that provides pre-recorded lectures followed by in-class exercises or activities. It's basically flipping it. And I say it again, flipping it meaning the lecture now goes home and the activity now comes into class. So that's that, that reversed homework model. Because if you think about it, the way it's always been done is you get lectured in class, and then whatever you don't finish, you end up taking home, and then you have to do the activity at home. Well, from a teaching standpoint, I can tell you I never knew were my kids actually the ones doing the projects at home or were their parents. The other part is I didn't have a whole lot of control. I like this a whole lot better to be able to say, watch the, watch the video at home, and then tomorrow we're going to do the project in class. That allows me to see what they're thinking, to, to, see that, to see the learning taking place, and knowing it's their learning and not necessarily a parent's learning or a sibling's learning. Uh, and then the final one, devoting class time to application of concepts might give instructors a better opportunity to detect errors in thinking. It's just it's firsthand. It's right there in front of you. Uh, let's see. Ways to shift the learning. Next one would be Genius Hour. Genius Hour, one of my favorite activities. I have several teachers here at Warner doing Genius Hour. Um, Genius Hour is simply put, you take an hour per week. Some people might do two, but I, I would say it's about an hour per week, and you're going to have students working on a project that they are passionate about. A um, couple things that I have witnessed. Uh, I had some second graders. I had one second grader in particular that um, was very curious about uh, World War II. And he wanted to know, he wanted to know um, some, of the, some of the details with World War II. So he decided his Genius Hour project was going to be what happened, what happened leading up to World War II. Well, obviously, obviously, second grade curriculum is not going to touch on World War II. But this was a passion of this student. His name was Robbie. So this was a passion of Robbie's. He wanted to find out about World War II. Why are we stifling that passion and saying, you know what, you're going to learn that in 7th, 8th, ninth grade. Why not let our students explore those passions now? So for one, for one hour per week, for four weeks, he worked on this project about World War II, and he ended up making a diorama of, of a, basically this model of how he envisioned, how he read and researched the invasion and it was really cool to look at he had the, he had the planes he had the he had the ships coming in from the sea very elaborate he ended up sharing it um, we have an interest fair here in the western school district it was it was top notch um, i had another student recently um, he's very hands on and he wanted to know more about um, how a motor worked so his genius hour project was creating a four cylinder engine so he, he did this model of a four-cylinder engine. He's a third grader. Now, I mean, it's, that's not in the third grade curriculum. But too often we're stifling our kids' learning by saying, nope, we don't have time for that. Genius hour, one hour per week for X amount of weeks, 
gives our students a chance to be passionate about what they're doing and that there is no better form of personalized learning. That is, to me, that is personalized learning. The number one thing for teachers when it comes to Genius Hour, you've got to let go of control and you've got to be okay with it being messy. Learning is messy. And if you are willing to be more of a facilitator rather than a teacher and you're okay with messy learning, then Genius Hour is, there. like I said, there is no better form of personalized learning in my opinion. Um, the, the quote over here, I have no special talents, I am only passionately curious. And that's an Albert Einstein one. Okay, so that is Genius Hour. The next one um, is Coach's Eye. Now, Coach's Eye, I know some of you will immediately think that this is um, potentially a physical education um, class or something to that effect. It doesn't have to be, but I got to give you a story. Um, I, my uh, phys ed teacher, um, she first of all, she's a rock star. Um, she's on Twitter at uh, Power um, Power of PE. So look her up. She's great. A couple things that she does that are really impressive is she came to me and she said, "I know that I'm going to be assessed. Part of my evaluation each year is going to be on personal. It's going to be on um, student growth." And I said, "Exactly. Yep, student growth." She's like, "Well, what are you thinking as far as student growth and phys ed?" And I told her, I said, you know, there's a lot of different ideas I have. You know, you could have the students run a mile, and you could time them in the spring and time them in the fall, and you can see what the difference is. You, know, you can have students doing the, um, the presidential fitness test. You can, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things that you could do. And I said, the other thing is, you know, you can pick a small unit, and you can do some, some before and after type stuff. And she took that to heart, and what she did is she was doing a, doing a hockey unit. And here in Michigan, as most people know in Michigan, hockey's a real big deal. We've got the Detroit Red Wings. We've got some other things going on. Um, good programs. Michigan State's a great program. Michigan's a heck of a program. Um, we got Lake Superior State up north. And the Red Wings pretty much take the cake. But um, So it's a big hockey state. So we're playing. We're learning how to do hockey. So she videotapes with her iPad. And she videotapes the kids at the beginning. And then she gives instructions over a couple weeks, and then she videotapes at the end. So she came in for her for her evaluation at the end, and she had every student a, a beginning and an end, and it was able to show the video of where they started and where they finished. There is no there to me there was no better form of visual growth than right there. The proof was in the pudding. Seeing where kids started and to where they finished up. That, to me, that was personalized learning. And, and that's something very simple. It doesn't have to be phys ed. I mean, if you get creative, you can, you can videotape a student, and it could be you videotape them reading, and you're trying to figure out their fluency, and then you videotape them in the, after a few weeks of instruction, and you, you're listening to that fluency. You will be able to see the growth, the individual growth. This is, that, to me, is personalized. So Coach's Eye, it's an app. Um, that would be another way to really personalize the learning. Um, choice reading. So, so now let's get back into a little bit more academic piece. Um, growing up, I was the student that despised reading. And I despised reading for a couple reasons. I remember specifically in third grade sitting in my seat and having the teacher say, okay, everybody, turn to page 162. And I turned to 162, and there's a story in there about a ballerina. And I end up sitting there, and I have to read. And I, I've, I've literally, I've counted down the line from my classmates. And I know exactly what paragraph my teacher is going to call on me. So it's going around. It's going Johnny. It's going Susie. It's going Billy. And I'm going, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, there's seven. I'm number eight. So then I go into the book and I count eight paragraphs, I know exactly what paragraph she's going to ask me to read. Well, I mean, you can simply see, I didn't, I didn't pay attention. I didn't care about this story about a ballerina. I knew what part I was going to have to do, and I did it, and I was done. And I knew as soon as I was done, as long as I didn't disrupt class, as long as I made it sort of look like I was paying attention, that was the, that was the end of it. It was going to be over. Well, then I went on to fourth grade. 
And Mrs. White was my teacher in fourth grade, and she gave me a book that literally when I first looked at it, the first thing I did is I looked to see how many pages it was. And I thought, oh, goodness, I can't do this. And then she said to me, every morning you're going to tell me what happened the night before, and then we're going to read a chapter together. And I went, okay. So we started doing that, and I finally got through my threshold, so to speak. I got through those first 50 pages or so, and I started getting into the book. And at that moment, Mrs. White ignited a fire in me when it came to reading. And a big part of it was that I was able to go at my pace, even though she said, you're going to read a chapter tonight, then we're going to read a chapter together. You know, sometimes we had basketball practice and things like that, and I didn't get a full chapter done. And we would end up finishing it together, but she was right there beside me, and she was individualizing, and she was personalizing my learning right then and there, back way back when, when I was in fourth grade. I shift, I shift that to today's, today's kids. Today's kids, the first and foremost, what they want is they want some type of choice. I'm a believer in giving students that choice, but also giving some choice with parameters. I, you know, I do think that to sit there and, and say to, to a student, what do you want to read? You may have a student that says, I want to read Shakespeare. Well, they may not be able to comprehend that. So if you give that choice, but you give it some boundaries, and you say, here are 10 choices, pick one of these. There's always, there's always a way to make it so it fits what works in your classroom. These are two books on your screen. Donna Lynn Miller is, Donna Lynn Miller is really the guru when it comes to reading. Um, she has two books out, The Book Whisperer and Reading in the Wild. If you're looking to transform the way you are doing reading in your classroom, I would highly recommend these two. Here at Warner Elementary, I have, I believe, eight teachers that have already read um, The Book Whisperer, and I have several more that have read or are reading Reading in the Wild. And this is all about giving students choice in their reading, moving away from the basal, the, the options. Um, the constantly, as kids are reading, they're conferencing with teachers. They're telling them what's going on. They're talking. They're, go they're going into a bigger picture learning. So it's not just, it's not just, um, it's not just regurgitating, um, you know, the setting and the plot. You know, you're getting into some some nitty gritty. You know, what is the problem in the story? Um, where's the turning point? And when you start to be able to have those conversations with kids, the the spark of reading is ignited. And that's really what I, I always hope for in, in our reading classes. I always hope that students will be, a fire will be lit under them and they'll become a lifelong reader. Uh, just yesterday, we had an author visit Liesl Shirtliff, she, um, she is the author of her a couple books. One is called Rump, and the next one is called Jack. Rump uh, basically is a shortened title from Rumpelstiltskin, but she's kind of made it into her own. And then Jack is short for Jack and the Beanstalk. Phenomenal. I mean, I had kids today up and down the hallways, and I, they're all carrying that book because we were able to bring in an author, and she was able to really get kids excited about reading and it's not about the basal. It's about igniting that fire. So that would be choice reading. I would highly recommend those two books. Uh, Writer's Workshop. Uh, Writer's Workshop is something that we just started here at Warner Elementary. You start out, everybody starts together. You do a mini lesson. And as you do your mini lesson, it takes eh, 10, 15 minutes typically. You're having students collaborate. And then after they collaborate, they go back, they're sitting at their desk, they're, they're going to be, sometimes it's this flexible seating, they might be sitting on the floor, they might be laying down on the carpet, sitting in a beanbag, and they're going to be working on the focus of what they want to write about. It might be a persuasive essay, it might be um, talking about a difficult challenge that they are facing, it might be something that uh, they've had to celebrate, but that's... When it comes to writing, writing is one of the easiest ways to personalize learning because everybody has their own experiences. 
So even if you're all writing on the same topic, their experiences are going to be very different and that's going to make it much more personalized. We, like I said, this is our first year in the Writers Workshop. Um, I, what I really love seeing, and you can probably see it if you're looking at the picture right now, I've got a teacher bent down working one-on-one -on -one with another student. That to me is those purposeful conferences, one-on-one. -on -one, what we're doing there is we're individualizing it, we're personalizing the learning. That, when, you, when it comes down to personalized learning and getting back to our main focus, that to me, that's powerful. Seeing teachers working one-on-one -on -one with students, building those stronger relationships. So let's see, how will you take the next step? Uh, the toughest step is oftentimes the first one. I, I tend to think that, that it starts with culture. Um, to me, that's where it always starts, relationships and culture. You have to have a, a building culture that is allowing for risk taking, it's allowing you to make a mistake and it's okay. You're not going to get dinged for every single mistake that you make. So I think to me that's where it always starts. It has to be your mindset that it's okay to make a mistake and I'm also going to build strong relationships with my kids because they're ultimately you have no chance at personalizing the learning if you don't know your kids. You have to know your kids. Um, after that, the next the next step, and I think this is a control piece, the next step is the ability to allow learning to be messy. Allow learning to not look exactly the way you want it to look. And that's where you're gonna you're gonna take the title teacher and you're gonna basically put that aside and you're gonna be more of a facilitator. And I know, I know that that's going to be very difficult for educators because there are so many educators around the world that educators are known to be control freaks. And that's okay. I mean, that's just, it's probably in your DNA. It's, it's probably in my DNA. But I encourage you to, to let go. Let go. Be a facilitator and not just, not just um, a teacher. You know, take that next step. In this picture that you're looking at, we have fifth graders helping out our second graders. That to me is powerful. That's where the teacher doesn't have to be the store of all knowledge. Knowledge is out there for all students. Okay, so, so now those are some ways to do it. What are some of the barriers? Um, because this is oftentimes, this is what I get. I get the pushback as the administrator and I say, and I hear from, I hear from teachers and I've heard it over the last five years, that, you know, that sounds great, but, well, here it is. So some of the barriers could be your teaching partner. Um, maybe you want to do all these things, and the person that you team teach with or that you work with on a daily basis doesn't want to do these things. That can be extremely challenging. What I would, what I would, I'd do a couple things. Um, maybe it's a poisonous relationship and you need to talk to your administrator about maybe switching to a different grade level. That's extreme, but maybe that's what needs to happen. Another one is, how do you get your teaching partner on board? Maybe you can go to an ed camp, possibly go to a conference, possibly um, buy, buy that teaching partner a book and say, you know what, let's, let's read this book together and see what we can, what, how we can get better. Um, if you can get that teaching partner that's a barrier or a block to take even a baby step, you're moving in the right direction. Uh, the next one that can be a block would be administration. Um, I have heard many times I've had teachers come up to me from other districts. I've been at conferences and they say, you know what, personalized learning sounds great, but um, I'm not getting any support from my administrator. Um, what I would do and I, this is a this is a touchy one, but what I would do is I would I would share articles and research with your administrator about best practice, and I wouldn't do it in a way of I gotcha. I would do it in a way of, hey, this is what I've been learning and researching. Is it okay if I share this with you? One of the one of the best ways to get a point across is to ask questions. So sometimes going in and meeting with the person and saying, 
you know, what is your philosophy? What are you hoping to see in classrooms? And getting that person to answer those questions will give you some insight into their background and then you can start having a conversation. Um, I oftentimes hear and see with my own eyes these conversations become confrontational because one person is talking at the person rather than just having a conversation, rather than trying to work together. And, and remember, we're all on the same team. We're all on the same team. We're all educators. We're all working towards what is best for kids. Now, the way we are going about it may be very different, but we're all on the same team. And I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm always, I don't see eye to eye to, with my teachers every single day, every single hour, but I, I'm open to their ideas and I'm listening to them. And even though I may not 100% agree, I'm open to that. And I'm, I'm willing to say, let's give it a shot. Let's see if it works. Because if I'm going to be, if I think I'm the smartest person in the room, that's where I have failed. I have to let other people take the lead as well. Um, okay, enough about administrators. District. What if your district is the barrier or the block? Um, I have heard of this. And sometimes you have district initiatives and you, and you have to do certain things. Um, that's a really tough one as well. But what I would encourage, very similar to administration, is sharing research, sharing best practice, and sharing articles with a curriculum director, a superintendent, an HR person, or something along those lines. That would be valuable, valuable pieces of information, very similar to how you would deal with an administrator, how you would deal with the district. Time. Um, time I hear all the time because I know that I know that teachers constantly you you need more time. I agree. We all need more time. I need more time. But I'm going to say this, and I don't take this the wrong way, but I'm going to say it that if it's a priority, you'll you'll find time. If it's a priority, you'll find time. It's just like with exercise. If it's a priority, you'll find time. Maybe not every day, but you will. I mean, look at Genius Hour, one hour of each week. Maybe, maybe it's going to be hard at first, but once you see the spark lit under your kids, you're not going to give it up. Um, next up, money. Money. And here's the, the one with money comes across. I hear money quite a bit when it comes to choice reading. And teachers say that they need, a, they need their own library. Well, if money is your block... I, some teachers have written grants. I had a second grade teacher last year that um, wrote a grant, and the grant place said, I mean, she basically, she got the grant, to make a long story short, she got the grant. But she was contacted, and I was contacted as well. There was only 30 people in the entire state of Michigan that applied for that grant, and hers, hers was the winner. So some people immediately say, I can't write a grant. Well, one thing to keep in mind, not a lot of people write grants. So if you do a little bit of research, if you put a little bit of time in, you're going to be going after some money that is out there and available that not a lot of people know about and not a lot of people try. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to encourage people to look for grants. Also look for, you can go on the internet and you can, you can um, go to GoFundMe. Sometimes people will fund different things. You can also work with your local district library. So time and money seem to be really big barriers. Time, make the time. Money, there's, you know, there's always another way. There's always fundraising. There's always another way. It's not necessarily going to be easy, but there's always another way. Knowledge. Um, okay, so when it comes to knowledge, a couple things as far as barriers and blocks when it comes to personalized learning, I'm going to encourage you to do a couple things. Um, if you don't have a Twitter account, get on Twitter. Twitter as an educational resource. And let me repeat repeat that again. Twitter as an educational resource. It's not Twitter as what are you eating for breakfast. It's not Twitter as did you see the highlight of that game. It's an educational research, resource that you can use for research and for connecting with people. The next thing when it comes to knowledge, get your hands on a couple books. Um, there's podcasts out there. There's blog posts. If if you're looking for it, and there's this powerful tool, and I'm going to say this with a, just a tinge of sarcasm, there's a powerful tool out there called Google that will probably help you with some of that research. Um, 
and you will find when it comes to personalized learning there there's a growing number of resources available just by simply googling it and and looking for it there's also videos on YouTube on personalized learning I would I would really encourage you to go that route and then finally the the barrier or the block of fear too often too often the people that are unwilling to take the next step is because they don't want to leave their comfort zone and, and this goes back to a culture and I, I'm gonna ask the question what would you encourage your kids to do maybe your own kids maybe your students what would you encourage them to do I have not yet discovered a teacher that would tell their students or their children don't try it most of them would say goodness I'd say hey go for it so if you would tell your kids that why wouldn't you take the same advice that would be that would be my piece on fear um, so are you willing to take the next step remember fail first attempt in learning there's the personalized learning versus the current system get on Twitter it's a valuable resource and if there's only if you only take away one or two things from this webinar here's what I hope you take away we're all on our own ladder of learning maybe you're at the whole group level maybe you're at the personalized level you, we're all on this ladder of learning how can you take the next step and the number one most important piece you cannot personalize learning unless you build relationships with your kids so relationships has to be first and foremost uh, thanks again for listening to uh, this webinar. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Greg here in just a minute. If there's any questions, comments, you can uh, obviously contact me. Um, my Twitter handle is at Benjamin Gilpin, and I'm also going to be sharing, uh, I think Greg's going to be able to share my email address if anybody needs to contact me personally as well. Thanks, Ben. Um, actually, if you could, if you could put your uh, email address in the uh, chat box there. We had it all in one place. That would be yep. perfect. Um, well, I'd like to say thanks. Um, I think the thing that's unique about this, and actually been having you as uh, part of this group, is that administrator perspective. Um, the group that we've been working with is primarily um, made up of teachers, which is a really, really good perspective to have. But I think the way that you've been able to kind of bring this all together and look at it. Um, from that building level has been very helpful. Um, that school as a system, you know, where you're talking about the, the culture, um, the instruction and the relationships and how all those pieces come together um, is very powerful. And then I also like how um, you talked about some of the, the look for's. So, you know, the fact that learning is messy. So as an administrator, you know that you're going to see some messy classrooms, if you will. You're going to see a teacher talking to just one student. You're going to see the teacher kind of facilitating some learning. So it's, um, I think it's a really good point in that uh, administrators need to be comfortable with the fact that the classroom is, is messy and it's different than what we've traditionally seen. So I really, really appreciate uh, that perspective and I appreciate your time today. Um, so um, if you have anything further, um, please share. Um, otherwise, we will get this posted. Um, it will be posted tomorrow, and we'll keep it on a, up on our website with the other ones. So anything else you'd like to add, Ben? No, I appreciate the time, and, um, and hopefully uh, hopefully people gain something, um, move forward some way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah, that's the plan. Well, and I think this is this is very helpful. So, um, especially as we're out kind of um, working to bring some more administrators into the into the scene here. So, very good. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Thank you.